and for the questions many of you have already sent in when you registered. Our webinar, Racial Justice in the Courts, South and North, is sponsored by the Center for Politics and the People at Ripon College. My name is Brian Smith, co-director of the center, working with our co-director, Professor Henrik Schatzinger, here on the screen with me as the host of the webinar. He and I will be reading later the questions many of you sent in already who've registered, and then we will also read questions that the attendees live today are, will be able to write, if you wish, in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Today is Constitution Day in our country, which commemorates the signing of the Constitution of the United States in Philadelphia on September 17, 1787. To celebrate the Constitution and the rights guaranteeing it to all Americans, we are delighted to have two eminent just judges with us this afternoon. They will share their many years of experience as African Americans working to uphold these rights in the criminal justice system in Arkansas and in Wisconsin. Judge Ali Neal Jr. in Arkansas and Judge Maxine Aldridge White in Milwaukee. Judge Ali Neal Jr. is the grandson of a slave and the seventh son of a farmer. He grew up in the Mississippi Delta of Eastern Arkansas, 60 miles from, his, from where Emmett Till was murdered in 1955. Ali Neal and Emmett Till were the same age. He served in Vietnam and participated in the Memphis sit-ins before returning to his hometown of Mariana, Arkansas. There he directed a community health clinic which met intense resistance from white people because it was under the control of black folks. But recently, this same clinic celebrated its 50th year of service to the Mariana community. When he became a lawyer, he helped pass important voting rights legislation and was appointed by the governor of Arkansas to be the first black per prosecutor in the state of Arkansas, a job he describes as his most difficult. Judge Neal served four years as a circuit court judge and then 11 years on the Arkansas Court of Appeals. He is now retired. Just recently, the Butler Center of Little Rock, Arkansas published his autobiography, Outspoken, The Ollie Neal Story, which was written with the assistance of 64, 1964 Ripon College graduate Jan Reedy, who is also with us this afternoon from Texas on the screen. And you see, uh, you see copies of the book that have been just held up by Henrik and by Judge White. The book is available on Amazon, it's selling well, and there's also a copy in the Ripon College Library. We're also honored to have with us Judge Maxine Aldridge White of the Wisconsin Court of Appeals in Milwaukee. She too grew up in the South, born and raised in rural Mississippi in a family of sharecroppers. A graduate of the University of Southern California, and Marquette Law School. She worked in the Social Security Administration in Chicago and Milwaukee and served as the first African-American woman to serve as Assistant United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Wisconsin. She was appointed and then later elected as Wisconsin District Judge in 1993. Judge White is the first African-American Chief Judge in the District Court's history. She is also former chair of the Wisconsin Governor's Task Force on Racial Profiling and a former member of the Wisconsin Supreme Court Committee on Gender Neutrality. She was appointed to the Wisconsin Court of Appeals in January of this year. Both of these eminent judges have had considerable experience in working for civil rights and criminal justice in their respective communities before joining the courts. As African Americans, they have experienced personally and in their professions how race is a factor in the judicial system of our country. And so we welcome you, Judge Neal and Judge White, to our webinar this afternoon. Welcome also to Jan Reedy uh, in Texas, who is going to guide the conversation between the two judges for about 35 minutes. And now on our screen, you will see the three main questions that the judges have decided to focus their conversation around. First, what are the components of our justice system as citizens encounter it? Secondly, how fair is the judicial system, especially for minorities? And third, 
How can citizens of all ages contribute to its improvement? Jan, would you be so kind now to guide the judges in a conversation around these questions? Yes, thank you very much, both of you. Well, because racial justice in the courts, North and South, is such a broad topic, I have tried to limit our discussion because uh, we have a limited amount of time. Um, and and mm. let me just start this way, just by saying that our judicial system is probably divided first uh, into two parts, civil and criminal. But here, here we're gonna concentrate our discussion on criminal justice, primarily at least. Um, and uh, Judge Neal, first we need a little background. Can you briefly give us the major components of the criminal justice system as it's encountered by our citizens? We, all of this, thank you, uh, Jan, good to see you again. Thank, uh, thank both of you professors. And good to see you, Judge White. I'm looking for to the time when the virus will lift and I can meet you personally. Uh, <laughs> the, the judicial system is really the, the sort of the, in, in, in our country, we think of the three branches of government. The judicial system uh, is one branch and that part that deals with criminal justice uh, starts off with uh, with the Constitution, but the Constitution is a part of the laws that exist. So the, we have the laws uh, that uh, sort of describe, uh, proscribe what conduct uh, uh, is uh, Im improper and the penalty when found uh, to have violated that, that, related that particular law. Uh, there's law enforcement that, uh, uh, that we give our authority to <clears throat> represent our interests and say that based on what I see, this is a law enforcement officer, you have now uh, violated uh, some law, and therefore I've got to detain you for a uh, presentation to the next level. And the next level is the courts. Uh, and the courts then make a determination about what level of violation you've done and, and what should be the result of the penalty based upon what the laws have said. And then, of course, there's the correctional system that where we find ourselves when we get crossways with the laws and the courts find that that has occurred and provide a sentence. Good, good, good. Thank you. So my understanding is the purpose of the criminal justice system is to deliver, deliver justice that's efficient, effective, accountable, and fair. And here today we're going to, since this is Constitution Day, the Constitution guarantees fair, and so this is what we're going to concentrate on. We will focus now on how fair or unfair our justice system is to minorities. And I ha also have to mention, going back to the title today, <clears throat> is that um, even though it says North and South, our two judges are speaking for their home states, uh, Judge Neal of Arkansas and Judge White of Wisconsin. And uh, they may or may not be representative of other Northern or Southern states. <clears throat> So here we go. Judge White, just how fair to minorities is the justice system in your state of Wisconsin? Well, I think that the justice system, I'm glad to use in the title justice system because it's more than just the judges, as Judge Neal has just explained. And so when it comes to looking at the mottos or the um, obligation of each of the states, including Wisconsin, in a process, what we generally will do is uh, we look at each case that comes before us. Uh, they're started on the street by a neighbor with a problem with the fence and a fight in the bar. And then uh, our government steps in if the police is called and the police takes their thoughts to another government official, that government official may be the DA or, or another administrator in a, in a smaller town. And uh, ultimately it ends up in front of a person who is supposed to resolve a dispute using a certain set of laws. Well, who are these people? Well, Judge Neal is one of them and Judge Maxine is another one of them. We all come to the bench or wherever we are judging with a certain set of values. And I think that's where it begins and sometimes it ends for some people. 
So the message that I don't want to forget to give is that we need to make certain that when someone is given the honorable position of judging conduct, behavior, or cause and coming out with a resolution, that don't, we don't forget that that individual person has biases, implicit and otherwise, that needs to be checked by an accurate and a fair application of the laws. Now, our system does not screen out other uh, faults that we might have. Judge Neal gave an a, a example of a, a, a criminal matter that might come because there's a fight or something like that and, and uh, someone has to resolve it. The problem gets to be that uh, it's not always uh, brought to us in a fair manner, it's not always resolved in a fair manner. And what we look for is justice. Have I per, given a person access to the forum? Some people don't get access. They don't have lawyers, they can't afford them. The ones they get are not prepared. The court doesn't respect the ones that do come in. So you gotta have access to the forum. You gotta have somebody or be smart enough to fight for yourself. You gotta have somebody who's gonna listen and give you a fair shake. It's a, it's a very complex matter when you place everything on the robe of the judge to make everything just and fair because we are fallible human beings. So what we need is checks and balances. We need the public to be interested in who wears the robe, how they wear it, what are the outcomes. And for years and years after I joined the bench and even as a federal prosecutor, many people didn't watch no or they just expected this to happen. I think fairness will come and results will change when we'll held to certain obligations to make that equal justice on the law come to fruition. There is unfairness in our system. There is injustice done by our system to people all over the land and including our state. So what we've done in Wisconsin is try to take a look at ourselves, address those implicit biases. We have a committee of judges, prosecutors, public defenders, and everybody else who gets together. We talk, we acknowledge those implicit and explicit biases and we try and guard against allowing them to function in the jobs that we serve. Very good, thank you. Um, can I also ask you Judge White um, to talk a little bit about over incarceration, the impact it has on minorities and the most egregious uh, impacts that 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 has that 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 over incarceration has absolutely the united states of america imprisons more people than any other place on the planet and wisconsin in the u.s is at the top of the state when it comes to disparate incarceration we are well blacks occupy about six or seven percent of the population in wisconsin and maybe as high as 50 percent of those in prison and when you look at the local jails as well as the prisons, it might be higher than that. We spend billions of dollars housing people with the expectation that housing them will get a better result when they return to the hometown. We have one zip code in Wisconsin, 53206. I attend church in that zip code. It is one that has been written about a lot nationally. It probably has more missing African-American males from that zip code. Uh, to incarceration than any in the nation. The person who gave me a chance to serve on the bench in Wisconsin, the Honorable Tommy Thompson, who is retired, appointed me as the second black woman ever to take the bench in Wisconsin, and the first one to serve on a state trial court of general jurisdiction. Tommy Thompson wrote a book uh, recently, his memoir. He spoke at Marquette University, and I encourage the audience to go online and look up Tommy Thompson's memoir. One of the things he said that was very striking to the audience while he sat on stage at Marquette in front of hundreds of people was that he was very proud of a lot of things he's done in his career. But the one thing that really, really gets to him is the failure of the criminal justice system while he was governor for 14 years. The amount of people who were incarcerated, the amount of money we spent, and the return on our dollar was almost zero because we made things worse. There is over incarceration in, uh, in the nation and for racial minorities, it is horrific. 
It cheats families out of fathers and brothers and uncles, churches out of deacons and preachers, and, and it's just devastating. So, and it's not always necessary to get the results that we think that our constitution mm -hmm. is demanding of us. But that's some of the, the cause now that everybody is looking at. We are no longer looking at it in the shadows. People are facing it head on in all, all institutions, the justice system, the law schools. We have so many different committees, the ABA, the American Bar Association, the State Bar, everyone is talking about how do we get out of this web? In Wisconsin, we've been in the web with the same stats since the 1970s. Ooh. It hasn't changed very much until wow. recently, since the 70s. Well, thank you. Um, Judge Neal, uh, can I ask you to address the same question? How fair or unfair is the ju judicial system in your state? I think the judicial system is reflective is reflective of the broader population in the state. And we've got a population that uh, uh, grew out of uh, slavery, as a matter of fact, grew out of uh, uh, having a certain body of people enslaved. And so while we made some progress and people like me continue to have great hope because we really are impressed with that document called the United States Constitution, uh, the fact of the matter is that we have a good ways to go. Uh, I, I, I don't want to try and repeat anything that uh, uh, Judge White has laid out. She's done an excellent job. But I can say a couple of things. One, uh, all of us, even the, at every level, the police, the judges, the, uh, the prosecutors, the jurors, we all are products in a large measure, in a substantial way, we're products of what we've been exposed to during the course of our lives. And that exposure sort of tells us how we relate. In Arkansas, uh, it has been the tradition that uh, black folk uh, op occupy a secondary uh, role uh, in the social law, uh, a secondary role that's pronounced. Uh, and so that is reflective among the judges, the prosecutors, the jurors, the uh, uh, police officers. And in Arkansas, police have a certain image of uh, being kind of cowboyish. And by that, I mean, uh, to be a, a police officer, part of what you want to be is able to uh, uh, do like the cowboys did. I watched lots of westerns, and and my western cowboy heroes come into town, and they can do what they call town taming. Uh, the police does whatever is necessary to straighten up the town, and that's what our police officers uh, have operated on. And we're making some baby steps now in trying to deal with all of that. We have in Arkansas. We, uh, my committee with, on which I work since I've been retired, uh, in just three years ago convinced uh, uh, our Supreme Court that they ought to consider uh, entertaining a, an instruction in, in jury trials on implicit bias. Uh, now, that instruction has been made a part of the uh, 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 standardized instructions for courts to use, uh, but the judges have, still have some uh, discretion into whether it's applicable. Uh, so we're just making baby steps in Arkansas. Uh, we've had, uh, on my court of appeals, the population in Arkansas is about 15.7% African American. The, prim the criminal, uh, uh, the persons incarcerated, uh, the uh, penitentiaries in Arkansas uh, are made up of about 48% African American. Uh, those are the best numbers I got about two years ago. Uh, so we're making baby steps. So remember the, 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 the justice system we have in my county, as recently as the 70s, uh, the, the job of the police was to keep the blacks in line. If they were on the streets, you could arrest them still. In, in 1970, you could arrest black people for vagrancy. That means they didn't have a, a viable means of making a living, so you put them in jail. Uh, when police arrest black people, uh, as part of the arrest is the punishment. That is, you take them, uh, I remember there used to be a practice in my town uh, where if they wanted to really teach you a real lesson, they'd wait and arrest you on Friday because none of the judicial officers would be available on Saturday and Sunday. And so they had you the full weekend, and those of us who were familiar with that, and I didn't get to be a lawyer until I was 37 years old, so, so part of the time I was one of those who was very much conscious of that. And I do remember an occasion where uh, my sheriff was trying to figure out how to get me arrested on Friday. I just 
game them and disappeared on Friday and was back Monday because he didn't have any reason to rest it, so he didn't. Uh, but the point is, this system was not designed to protect us, even though the original document that put us in place, the Constitution, gives us some hope. We're a long ways from there yet. The, the, the terms of equality of the system for Blacks uh, and other people is just substantially different. And so we've got a long ways to go. Long ways to go. Long ways to go. So I'd like to bring up, uh, Judge White, with you, perhaps some of the reforms that you've been involved with in Milwaukee County uh, to reduce incarceration. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. In about 2008, uh, the jail system came up over uh, uh, Milwaukee County, I should say to the audience, is the most populated county in the state of Wisconsin and has the majority of uh, brown and black and uh, has a more uh, mixed population of diversity than most counties in the state. And uh, Milwaukee County of the 249 trial judges has 47 of those judges and about 20 other judicial officers plus 18 municipalities and their uh, municipal judges, et cetera. And so in 2008, when the jail became uh, subject to the oversight of the federal government, uh, our sheriff, our DA, our police chief at the time, our chief judge, uh, the head of the board, the county exec, all of the government uh, letters and alphabet came together so that they could say at the time, we can manage this if you give us a chance. But what grew out of that is an instrument that's not known or not used around the nation, and that is the Milwaukee Community Justice Council. It was created by ordinance, and every head of government in Milwaukee County has a seat on it, including the chief judge. And out, that instrument can operate almost as a united front for all of the independently elected people to decide as a group how to attack certain problems. Because our jail population was so huge and the space to put them was so small, and we were having a large problem with the federal government oversight, uh, we decided as a county to put together that, that instrument. It has grown to be one of the most sought after united fronts that other jurisdictions want to talk to us about. Some people say, you mean the public defender talks to the DA and the sheriff talks to the chief and judges come to a meeting and share ideas about how they can do their jobs better? So this council applied for a grant with the MacArthur Foundation, a very um, involved foundation with billions of dollars uh, used for good. We competed as a county and a court system and a council, and we were awarded a total of about close to $5 million plus technical support. And out of it, what we did, we promised them, they wanted us to promise three things, that we would work on racial disparities, Low, lower the amount of people that are in jail. So it required us to take a look at bail and do things differently. That putting a hundred bucks on a broke person's back who had burglarized or stole a sweater from a store, uh, was that hundred dollars really guaranteeing anybody anything on the front end? Or should we work on during that window of opportunity using the pretrial system to allow the person to try and make some showing as long as they can comply with public safety and be free so they could work with their lawyers and go back to their jobs and try and work through whatever problem they had encountered. So we have had about a 20% reduction in the use of our jails since we started this process in uh, mid to late 2015. And we expect to keep going with it. But what it taught us is that we could learn a lot about who's in our jails, the mentally ill, the poor, the black, the brown, and, and just a whole bunch of people who had problems that if we allowed ourselves to stretch our obligations under our oaths individually as a group of leaders, then we could give some of those services to people by attaching them to mental health providers, uh, other uh, substance addiction thing. The DA would stave off a minor crime while they work through problems with the family. And so we came up with sort of restorative justice uh, on our own that was not at war with the law is permissible under our state rules, the way we manage these therapeutic courts or these therapeutic models. But it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of resources. We have to screen people when they first come in. 
to see what kind of mental health problem or challenge they have. Where are their medications? Can we get the private sector that treats them to step in and give us some services? Are we just gonna keep them in jail? By the way, we measured that about 100 of them were costing us millions of dollars because they were recycling through the courts because they had no place to go. So we have a system now where we are using jail for people who need it, who will not abide by the rules, who cannot be controlled, who will not, not disturb the witnesses during the pendency of the case. And so we use the, the jail system in appropriate manners and we are continuing to work on that. In the racial disparity area, we accepted technical support. These are huge problems, implicit bias. We bring in experts to talk to us as judges individually. We do trauma training. We train over 500 law enforcement, judges, uh, prosecutors, defense attorneys, our staffs on how to, how to uh, think through their own biases and kind of arrest them and operate in a different manner. It takes a lot of work and it takes baby steps to get this done. There was a lot of a resistance at first. We have book clubs. I know one of the questions that I got from uh, uh, Professor Smith had to do with a family watching us now with children. We have book clubs. So, so uh, um, my study partner at Marquette Law School, for example, was from a farm up north in Wisconsin and never had uh, personal uh, uh, relationships, friendships with African Americans. We studied together for three years. I was much older than him. He was young. I had had a career going back to law school. And we got to be very, very close friends. But I learned about his journey, and he learned about mine. So he's a parent now that can teach his children, don't be preoccupied with all of the junk you learn about Black women or men on a TV set. I know that they are people too, that I have empathy for them. I, I have emotional support from one. I had help in my classes to become a good lawyer from one. So the thing that we can do as individuals, we want to shape into the institutional role model. But at the end of the day, it's going to take people, one person at a time, joining with one other person who joins with another, 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 to make a change in this dichotomy. But I'm just so happy that I'm in a community where everybody who thinks that everybody in this club, the council, ought to be fighting each other, really are worried about the same thing at night. How can we keep our children and families safe? And how can we have a good, strong community and a good life? Mm -hmm. Very good. Beautiful words. Beautiful words. Wonderful. Well, and the documents are attached with the, uh, the, the results of our progress on some of the initiatives. Thank you, Jan. Yes, ma'am. Um, and I think those will be mentioned before we leave as well by, by our host. Um, so that's a perfect time, I think, for us to move on to our third question. Um, uh, this is about what we can do as concerned citizens. I, I say concerned citizens here. How can citizens of all ages contribute to the reduction of the racial injustices uh, in the entire uh, judicial system? And this time, can I, I'm going to start with Judge Neal. Thank well, you. I, 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 I have to answer this question in a in the way that sort of reflects my upbringing. I too am a product of, of my life experiences uh, up to this this time. And so what I what we contribute, I think, is kind of reflective of our willingness to be organizers, to be to be organized in our community. The first thing that all of us really ought to be is we ought to be in Arkansas, we ought to be registered to vote and serving on juries. I, one of the things I learned in the, uh, uh, during the time when I was in law school is that many of us did not serve on juries. We found excuses not to serve. Well, when the jury does not reflect the attitudes in the community, uh, it is difficult for you to get a, what everybody believes to be a kind of a fair decision. The fact of the matter is that in uh, Four of the uh, six counties that uh, I initially served as prosecutor and as a circuit judge, uh, more than 50% of the population is African American. And yet, uh, in the earlier years, African Americans were registered to vote in numbers that were perhaps less than 40% uh, of what their white counterparts were registered to vote. And therefore, juries in even counties like Lee County, where the population was 60% uh, 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 African American, 
uh, you would be hard pressed to get one black person on the jury. Uh, now, that, some, that was game, but you gotta look at all of it. Some of it is game, sometimes the prosecutor used trick schemes and devices to make certain no blacks served on jurors, but many times blacks found excuses not to serve. We've gotta teach our folk, and those of us who have these high titles, and I consider being an appellate judge a pretty high title in Arkansas, we have the responsibility to take to our citizen friends, acquaintances, and others, this important fact that you've got to serve. Uh, the, the second thing is those of us who enjoy these high roles must expose our other people to what ex how exactly the system works. When I was uh, uh, in Mariana running a health center, uh, I used to take kids over to the legislature for them to see how the legislature operated. It was surprising, and I don't say this in trying to be uh, cynical, but it was surprising that these legislators would be down on the floor, some of them were drinking pretty good, and it would be hoo-hawing, and, 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 and my young people said, oh, I could be a legislator too. Uh, and when I was on the Court of Appeals, I used to every year bring uh, three or four groups from schools over to just see how our courts operate. And now I got the permission of my other uh, 11 colleagues to do that. But I thought I had a responsibility to do that. And of course, of course in a situation like Arkansas, where you're elected, it doesn't hurt your uh, effort to get elected. It's just pretty good politics, too. So, uh, so, so that's the second thing. Uh, try and share with as many folk as you can what is, uh, how the system works and how they need to participate. And then thirdly, uh, I think those of us who get these high jobs have an obligation to figure out how to influence our colleagues. I am proud of the fact that uh, I had a fairly substantial leadership role in convincing, uh, in doing a judicial uh, uh, education conference and uh, convincing our uh, Supreme Court that they ought to go back and consider and uh, a, a, a instruction on implicit bias. That, and and I, I think that what they finally, what some of the justices finally figured out, and uh, two of them took the lead on it, was that, uh, uh, was that, uh, that they too realized that they had been a product of what it is they were raised and that influenced how they thought. And that sometimes they ought not to let that influence them in any way. Uh, and so, so, so we have these three responsibilities I think are very important. We've got to get our folks to participate as, at every level that they can and starting with voting and serving on juries. We've got to get our uh, young people to understand how the systems work, expose them to legislative and judicial affairs. And we've got to work with our colleagues because sometimes I will tell you, I've been pleasantly surprised uh, at the response I've gotten from judges, uh, including judges who've written me notes and said, we really appreciate you bringing us that information because you've got to keep in mind just 45, 50 years ago, I was a boogeyman. I mean, I was considered to be the worst scout uh, uh, stain on the, on the Delta. Uh, and so even, and, and so some of these same persons who, because these judges, none of these judges in my area at that time, were under 50, we do have some judges now who are young, 45, 40. Uh, I was 51 when I became a judge. Uh, but all of these older judges will say to me that we appreciate you bringing us this information. And I got a warm reception when I led a committee that uh, called the Racial Justice and Criminal Justice System in Arkansas uh, to present a CLE for the uh, Judges Judicial uh, Council in Arkansas in, uh, 20, in 2017 first and then again in 18. Uh, and in 19, uh, Justice Wood of the Arkansas Supreme Court uh, produced and convinced her, her brethren on the court to approve a an instruction on implicit bias. Now this is, I, 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 I get almost embarrassed when I hear what my colleague is doing in, in Wisconsin. Uh, so, but, but, but I think what we have to do is we have to start where we are and do the best we can with that. And that's what I've tried to do. Uh, much of it has been just sort of one man stuff and bringing in somebody with you as best you can do. But, but we have not yet created in Arkansas a widespread spirit of how do we make this thing a little bit more fair. Uh, many of my folk in Arkansas think it's been all right. We really need to go back to the old days because someone's not going to allow that. To, uh, we will not get back to the old days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, folks, 
have a little bit of a picture of Arkansas. <laughs> okay, Judge White, um, same question for Wisconsin. Well, I grew up in the Mississippi Delta. I think there are 10 years between Judge Neal and me and our lives didn't change. Uh, you were uh, heading to grade school when I was born, I guess, if you were lucky in, in the South, uh, either one room school or the backyard. Uh, but um, it's, that world is not that far from me every day. Fannie Lou Hamer grew up right about 12 miles from me. She was one, 22 yeah. kids from Sunflower County. I, my home city was in Yanola, the county seat. She was nearly beaten to death on the steps of the courthouse. Her parents lost their sharecropping farm. I didn't know you could lose being a sharecropper because we never got anything anyway. But they lost the farm. Uh, they were nearly homeless, but she did not give up. So when I hear the, the, the speech in the street about Voting doesn't matter. I think about all the bloodshed. I think about the Miriam Wright element who came to my hometown, the only black woman admitted to the bar in Mississippi to speak for anybody in court that was black. I think about all of those people who marched through the Mississippi Delta and some didn't make it out. I went to Alcorn State University undergraduate and I saw edges around the campus burning. I saw the Klan when I was in undergrad. My, I saw my dad, who was third grade educated and a sharecropper, uh, fight to protect his family. Uh, it did not deter me from claiming my piece of the American dream. And so what I try and impart on people is don't give up on the American dream. It belongs to you and you, it's not going to come. Democracy is not going to stick. You got to get in there and make it stick. You got to get in there and experience it and share it. So what I see that when my family is the United Nations now, I have great nieces that don't even speak English yet because their other parent is teaching them their native tongue. I have, so my family went from all black to all everything. Uh, all are black, brown, native, African, uh, US and otherwise. We, we need to start with our families. We need to talk to our families about this crude, craft, ugly, uh, uh, nasty way we talk about each other. Uh, whether it is racially driven or just kind of hate mongering for no reason at all. We need to meet our neighbors. During this time, I am grateful to the young people and the, the, the very diverse group of marchers for the Black Lives Matter movement. I have never spoken to as many of my neighbors in my entire life, and I've been in this neighborhood since 1985. Stop, pause, breathe, say hi. Talk about the weeds that they are weeding because they are important to them and, and just take a moment. But you got to do what Judge Neal said. You can't sit on the sideline and complain. It's not fair to leave it all on a black robe in a courtroom or a few other people who show up for jury duty. Demand that the system give you a chance to get to jury service if you got babysitter problems. Figure out if you can be an alternate at different times of the year if you're a school teacher. Work with the system. We have a committee working on, well, how does the court make it easier for people to serve? Everybody doesn't, is not available during the daylight hours and still be able to feed their family. Everybody's got to give and bend a little bit. But things have gotten just like they were when I grew up really nasty, really evil. There are no lines of courtesy and decorum in a lot of people. We'll say anything, anytime, and show anything or anything anywhere. We need to talk to our families, our neighbors, the people who work with us. You need to call them on it. I was the only black female on the bench for 20 years. And, and uh, a young lady ran and won her seat, and now Governor Evers has appointed three others. But I was in the room with people, and I sometimes felt like I was not there. Sometimes they were all men, and they were not African American, they were not brown men. And they said things, and Max is all right with that. And so in order to get where I am now, I did what I saw my father do in Mississippi. I stood my ground as peacefully as I could because I knew others were dependent on me. 
to be a reflection of the ideals that we all say we are entitled to in America. What troubled me is, is that we had to let the young people, those who are fighting a pandemic, get in the streets and really remind us of why we love this land in the first place, despite what it did to us as a people and as a nation coming from all parts of the universe. Because everybody here except the Native American, Indian, or, or immigrants. And so we need to encourage people to focus on that. Read about it. It's not just fiction. It's go to see Hamilton and get grounded if you need to have fun while you learn our history. Look at the stage of Hamilton. Everything and everybody was represented. Every category. What happened to that? I am so happy that we have a group of people more diverse than the ones that took the streets in Mississippi, taking the streets in Arkansas and Wisconsin now, trying to rectify and save our democracy. Oh, thank you. Thank you very, very, very much, for both of you, for uh, inspiring words. Um, I believe it's time in this webinar, if it's okay with both of you, to move on to the uh, questions from our participants. Okay, Judge Neal and Judge White? Yes, that's fine. Yes. Okay, okay. I, will, I will start and I first I want to thank also the judges and I want to thank uh, Jan for leading the first part of the discussion and I want to thank all of our participants today as well as uh, all those who have submitted these questions um, and there are a lot of them. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to go through through all of them, but we will try to sort of, you know, capture the spirit of some of these questions. In fact, I just saw a question in the online, you know, in that uh, Q and A um, <clears throat> that you can use right now to ask questions. That was also very similar to some of the questions we saw that were submitted earlier. So we're trying to com combine some questions. Let me start uh, right here. So, in fact, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, the last question that came in was the almost the same question I wanted to ask, anyways. So, and that was. Uh, from a person in the Ripon area is asking, do we, o do we have only a facade of justice with overcharging and prohibitive bail leading to plea bargains in 96% of cases facilitated by a compliant quote unquote defense attorney in collusion with the district attorney whose reputation rests on the number of convictions? Now, before you answer, I will just mention um, a book that I think is really powerful and really, um, you know, I mean, that's just really this question really well. It's called Locked In, um, The True Causes of Mass Incarceration and How to Achieve Real Reform. It talks about the man behind the curtain, the prosecutor, which often is not part of any sort of public discourse in terms of reforms. But uh, I also will mention that uh, Wisconsin as an, as an example, hired uh, 60 assistant uh, district attorneys last year. Um, and as, as the question was asking, they have certain incentives, right, in terms of how to advance their own careers, which may not be in line with what is uh, beneficial for society. So how, how do you see this, uh, this, these problems of overcharging and, and, and others uh, mentioned in the question? Maybe, maybe Judge uh, White again, do you would lead? Could you start? Well, the prosecutor's job is a powerful uh, piece of power. <laughs> I was a federal prosecutor, and when I mentioned that, I didn't have many friends. Uh, but the local prosecutor in, in Wisconsin is elected. You got to, I mean, where, uh, before I, I was appointed or elected, people had a right to know what she'd been doing with her spare time. Where does she go? What things interest her? Uh, how does she speak about others? Is she involved in any other community way? What did she do as a lawyer before? Who did she represent? And did the people affiliated with her have a sense of that the person had some type of grounding and, and commitment? Uh, our DA in Milwaukee County, sometimes it just need a change. Uh, the DA that we have in Milwaukee, I think worked very hard and will allow any citizens without a title black, brown, white, uh, anyone to approach him and he'll set a meeting with you and, and take the tough questions from crowds. So the first thing you got to do is look at when the next election, who's in the job, 
What problems are you having with it? Can you talk to them? Can you get a round table with them and try and figure it out? Because uh, that, that amount of foolishness of trying to play with lives and property to advance oneself, you know, people are, the, the young people coming behind us are much smarter than that. They find different ways of catching those kinds of things and exposing them. And so what I would suggest is that these are tough jobs. Job of a district attorney, job of a federal prosecutor was one of the hardest jobs I had. Because I knew just by opening my mouth in a case, I could ruin somebody's life, even if they were not guilty later on. So you need someone who is ethical, who is careful, who is consistent, and who is, is open to having discussions with people about the problem. I, as I remarked earlier, and I'm gonna close with this, when we visited other places, the team from Milwaukee with the DA on it, that they were shocked. He was, he was one of the people saying that we got sick people in jail. You know, we, we have women in jail that got babies at home. We got people with substance addiction problems that are not getting treated. We gotta do something. He is one of the ones that's complicit with our revolution of restorative justice to do things differently. So it's the guy or the gal in the seat that you gotta examine because they have a lot of power, but they are put there by the people. Mm -hmm. They're put there by the people. Yeah, thank you, Judge White. Uh, how about uh, you, Judge Neal? How do you see these issues? Yeah, I, I think the question as you raised it can, can, can be answered, yes. That's, that's the yes meaning that we've got a facade of uh, justice, uh, but I don't stop that. I think I think it really would be it would be really bad for us to just stop and say because it ain't good, uh, because we have in place uh, some opportunities, some tools that we can use to make it better. Uh, I've served as a prosecutor myself, and I understand in Arkansas, prosecutors are elected, uh, or if there's a vacancy occurs, appointed by the governor. I was appointed by the governor. Uh, Prosecutors have all oh, just out, just completely unlimited discretion. I mean, the only thing you can do is uh, figure out how to get them out at the end of the term. Uh, uh, nobody, there's no review of a prosecutorial decision by uh, the Attorney General, Attorney General in, in Arkansas. Uh, I had one to call me one time. I said, if I need you, I'll call you. Uh, part of my posture had to be that he could not presume because I was black, he's going to run my district. And so my answer to him was a rather short answer. I don't say this is what goes on all the time, but Arkansas was a special, a special animal. I was, this is the first time Arkansas had ever seen a black prosecutor. So yes, the answer to the question is yes, it's somewhat of a facade, may not be, but there's some, there's some work for us to do to make it a little bit different. Uh, I served, uh, uh, when I served as prosecutor, uh, I was in, in a district that uh, uh, more than 60% of the uh, criminal defendants were African-American. And those are the folk I was sending to the penitentiary. A couple of high-level friends of mine, including a guy named Roger Slater, who used to be Secretary of Transportation, asked me less than three years ago, how did you come out of East Arkansas with the same kind of enthusiasm on the part of the black folk and the acceptance and some enthusiasm on the part of the white folk? I said, here's what I did. When I was prosecuted, I did the same thing I did when I was an advocate. I went to the churches and took those beatings and said, well, you did this, you ought to be let. I had a person tell me one time in church, so well, what you need to do is uh, this is our time. You need to send them white boys to the penitentiary and let them black boys go home. Well, that wasn't quite the answer, I don't think. And so I didn't adopt that strategy and explain why I could not. I did not think it would be in our interest or anybody else's interest, and I would not. And I think that, that if we, as, Dr., as, as Judge White has said, if we make ourselves available, we can do that. Now, I'm not sure prosecutors, we don't have many prosecutors doing that in Arkansas. I cannot say uh, that I'm impressed with the prosecutor in my district, uh, Judge White. Uh, uh, he knows, I don't think very much of how he operates. Uh, he's elected, uh, 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 but that's, that's the part of the Arkansas system. The prosecutor has unlimited, unlimited discretion, except when there's an issue of law that the judge gets a chance to decide on it. Uh, we don't have to make this system a little bit better. Uh, we can't say that because it ain't what it ought to be, that we can't do anything. We have to insist upon speaking to prosecutors. We have to insist upon telling them what our views are. I too am, not only am I hopeful because of the language in the Constitution of the United States, but I'm hopeful because I see what's happening out here during the Black Lives Matter situation. And I see young people doing things that I could not convince anybody to help me do back in 1970. 
1980. Uh, these young people now really do read. And while I don't have, I don't care too much, don't like too much the social media system that these little phones give you, they are wonderful tools. They all communicate uh, so well with each other. They all got the same information. They have a negative effect because you only get information from folk you that think like you think, and sometimes you need some other see some other information. But we've got to use that, and we've got to. I, I'm impressed when I do. I've got this book. I've just as as has been referenced, uh, and I go to, to sessions and talk to people, and I get warm reception because folk want to know what was it, what is it like, and that's what we need to learn. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Judge Neal. If, if Brian, if you allow me to ask one more question, then I'll you know uh, hand it over to you. Um, the I think here is a question that's looking at a very different angle, is for, and that is is asking, what is really your key message to citizens who express publicly that blacks currently have equal opportunity and are no longer disenfranchised in the U.S. In other words, in some ways, the you know what do you think people who say that our topic like racial injustice is in fact a moot topic, right? It's all it's it's about individual responsibility and it's about people who make bad decisions and that's their problem there is not there is nothing else to talk about what do you what's your key message and try to be you know concise yeah, if you could. i will two two things do a little bit of reading on statistics as to what's happening uh within the criminal justice system just do a little bit of reading in arkansas look at the incarceration rate and i guess if you you might want to argue then that black folks are all real bad and that's how come they make up 40 percent of the prison and then the second thing is, talk to some honest black people. Every now and then, read a book. Read, uh, and I certainly don't represent the perfect example, but read uh, Outspoken, the Alan Neal story. We talk about the experiences and we name names. So if those folk disagree, they can come up and say, no, you're lying on us. We didn't do that. Read the names. And that was conscious effort to put those names in there, not just talk about conditions. So do a little reading, talk to some people who have some real experiences. Get to know how somebody else has seen the world that you found to be so acceptable. Thank you. And uh, what would you say, Judge White? I would say that uh, the justice system is a branch of government, but it is not a life in America. Uh, my life is composed of, do I have financial opportunities, even though I have a, a very nice salary? Can I get the same uh, loan that that uh, my next door neighbor who is 29 years old can get a loan twice the size of mine with half the income. Uh, we don't have wealth as black people. Like when you eliminate the athletes and the movie stars and the singles, singers, we don't have wealth. We haven't had passed down wealth. Judge Neal and I came from slaves. We came from sharecroppers. We came from the Delta. You see us in a robe. We're carrying responsibilities like helping others. 15 nieces and 12 nephews do whatever they need to do. We split up the check among the churches and the community. We don't have a lot of people with assets and resources. Count the people on the bench in Wisconsin and tell me what color they are. Uh, we have this, when you, when you, when you see Maxine on a, on a screen like this, I'm not representative of the bench that was in place when Tommy Thompson appointed me. I'm not a representative of the bench as it ought to be today. And all of the, I haven't even gotten to the other jobs, but there is a fiction. Sometimes that little phone can make you think that things have leveled out. The statistics by a UW Milwaukee professor says that blacks in Milwaukee are no better off now than they were in 1970 when the manufacturing jobs left. I mean, the, the fast food places and the 40 hours a week or the 20 hours a week here and the absence of men because they are in prisons all across this nation. And when they come back, they are a burden on the people that are trying to raise those that were left behind when they went off to prison. It's about the economy. You have to have economic, have, we don't have medical care. COVID is tearing our black US communities apart. I mean, I talked to, I, I did Zoom with a friend from high school in Indianola, Mississippi. He said, people are dropping like flies. They're dying. They don't have health care. They don't have jobs. It was featured in Time Magazine, my hometown, as, as a tragedy among the COVID tragedies. And so there is a, there's a, a misconception about black and brown people 
all over the world. And what the audience here can do for me personally, which I will continue to do, is try and make your lives representative of a united nation in how you associate, affiliate with people. Who do you talk to? Who do you learn about? You know, do you get one, get um, uh, Justice Sotomayor wrote a book about her experiences as a little girl. She wrote it for children to read. She put it in the language that I had diabetes. I would go to take my medication and the word got around, they thought I was a drug user, illicit drug user. So she's written this book so that little girls and little boys can see someone that's different from them who's experienced a lie about who they are and what they're doing with their time that maybe will help them get over some problem they may be experiencing. It is not good for black and brown people in the US when it comes to economic and racial justice in our systems. And I'm talking about all the institutions, not just the court. It's not a good time for us. Yeah, thank you so much. I think these are very clear and powerful messages. And uh, you know, I hope people who hear those uh, kinds of arguments and their day-to-day -day conversations will pick up some of the things you have, you have said and sort of, you know, counter, counter that. Uh, I will now um, give, my, give my colleague, uh, Brian Smith, a chance also to ask a couple of questions. Uh, and uh, Brian, go ahead. Judge White, would you uh, just mention again that book by Justice Sotomayor? Do you have the title of it um, or? I bought the last copy of it when I was on a trip, a uh, business trip to Minneapolis. I, I stalked the library and got it from Barnes and Noble. She's only written one. And it's about her life as a child with diabetes. But what Judge Neal and I can do is, if you give us a cheat sheet, we can fill in the blanks of Tommy Thompson's book, Sotomayor's so book, and other questions that we might be able to send you something, and you could put it on the link. I'm not, right. It's only one book that she's written, though, yeah. for children. That would be very helpful, because we're going to send out a follow-up to all the attendees uh, where they can watch the recording, if they wish, and if you can send us the titles of those books, we will find that. Right <laughs> Thank you. But to follow up, you've both mentioned uh, in, in your remarks, Black Lives Matter. And one of our um, women alums from Ripon College in 1989 has asked this question. How do you foresee the Black Lives Matter and related current social justice movements impacting the legal system? How would you compare it to the impact of the civil rights movement of the 1960s? Is this different? Is this going to last longer? Is this going to have um, a major impact, not only on the courts, but on, on our, our uh, political system, on the attitudes of Americans? Uh, could you both comment on that, on where you see the Black Lives Matter making a positive contribution or not? Well, I certainly think that the, I've been impressed with what these young people are doing and, and how diverse uh, the participants are. Uh, I lived through uh, the 60s. I was actually involved in some of the activities, including the sit-ins uh, starting in the 60s when we had perhaps the uh, last great, great push. Uh, I think this is different. I think it's different because many of the young people uh, who are involved are, uh, are uh, better put to uh, express themselves, to expose what's going on around them. I will insist on that. I do agree that we've got to be a little bit practical about this thing. We've got perhaps the most divided uh, nation. We've got the greatest I, I see us now as being more, more divided than ever before. And we've got uh, some leadership elements that uh, promote that division. And uh, effectively, I might say, not just promote it, but promote it very effectively. And that division makes it more difficult. But I'm hopeful that when we, in the, in the final analysis, in the, in, the, in the final outcome, that what we will see is that those who are committed to uh, fairness, justice, equal, equality, uh, equity is going to prevail this time. Now, I don't think we'll have the perfect uh, situation come next June, or, or even if you want to use it this way, come January the 20th. Uh, but I think that we, we are on a step that I don't believe is going to be reversible. That's what I think. I think we're out in a direction I think it would be very difficult to reverse because of the broadness of the environment of the folks trying to make it happen. Judge White, how about yourself? 
I am I am a, a child too of the civil rights era, and I saw the burning and the bloodshed and and a lot more than I tried to uh, stuff in my trauma file. But um, I think that uh, both of them are powerful, and I think that the uh, the one now probably is is um, in some ways uh, advised and alerted by the past. Yes. Uh, they are going to the same spots. They are going after the same images. They're using some of the same language. So someone is reading. They're doing more than just FaceTiming. Uh, and I appreciate that. And it is substantially different. Uh, the most help my dad got in the most critical times as a broke sharecropper was from freedom-loving white people, as they call them in Mississippi. And there were a lot of them who were not as public with their support as the, as the uh, people are now. But I think that you also have a few more of us, uh, the Browns and the Black people, who can now move with those with greater economic prowess and get more done. And then our systems are different. Our manner of communication is different. Our opportunities are different. And I, I would like to just say that uh, I think that we have to appreciate every era from the days that we entered the shore all the way up until tonight that everything contributes to the health and wealth of our democracy. And I think that we can learn from both eras, uh, from the 60s and the 70s, the way everything rolled out then, because there was success there, even though my hometown never recognized, it's also one of those places that has a lot of history. It never accepted Brown versus Board. It never did. We never integrated. That Their sense of integration when they couldn't stand firm where they were was to give us all of the schools and take all of the resources with them. But we never integrated in my hometown. But the fact that they had the war about education made me push to get the Alcorn State University, made me push to get Secretary Patricia Harris to give me an award to go to the University of Southern California, made me push to get into Marquette Law School at a later date uh, where I had a lot of support with grants and awards and scholarships. And I was hired as an assistant US attorney right out of Marquette Law School. So the movement was behind, was the wind and the strength behind me. And now we have these young people at this phase of my life, maybe I'll have health care, Maybe I'll get a social security check. <laughs> you know, maybe I'll be around long enough to, to thank them for the work that they're doing now. But I think both of the eras of operation may be a little bit different. But I think the motivation is that we ought to be ashamed of the way we treat our own. We ought to be more empathetic and sympathetic. We all ought to be more thoughtful. We ought to do critical thinking about very important problems. And we ought to get involved in our systems of government. Just as much as we love sports, we ought to love the ideal of working on our democracy. And I think that's what they're raising up for us now. And I want to, before I forget, thank Rippon. I, you're not Marquette Law School, but I know that they're jealous of you tonight <laughs> because you are doing something that they generally do. And UW Madison in Wisconsin is big on the dialogue. I just want to thank you for giving us this opportunity at this very, very, very important point in our history. Thank you, both judges. Uh, there's another question that one of our attendees just put up on the screen, and it has to do with the whole issue of police immunity. And the question is, what is your view of the qualified immunity doctrine for police? And do you think abolishing this doctrine or simply eliminating the clearly established prong of the qualified immunity analysis would deter or reduce future cases of police misconduct? What do you think about that? I'm going to speak first. I'm going to stay out of the conversation. I'm not retired. I love my job. As a court of appeals job, I'm the middle level court. Most, a lot of our appeals stop at the court of appeals. And if I speak and give a hint about what I'm gonna do other than read what the circuit court or the trial court has done, see if they follow the law, see if there's any error they made that I ought to correct, and then issue an opinion along with my colleagues on the court of appeals. I don't wanna lose that very precious opportunity. So I will not speak about my view of any law outside of any facts that I'm weighing to see whether or not it's implemented. I, we do have the three branches of government. And the one thing you have to do, whatever job you're in, 
is figure out what the ethical rules are that govern your conduct. I wear my robe like my daddy taught us to, with grace and dignity and as much wisdom as I can garner to get the truth about what I'm reviewing. Does Neil you retired? As a, as a retired, uh, as a retired uh, judge, I certainly agree absolutely with what Judge White has just said. She needs to stay out of this discussion because we she should not be have to recuse because she has already announced and the newspapers will show that she has an opinion on the subject. Now, uh, on the other hand, uh, I can speak to it a little bit differently, I think. Uh, I don't want to tell you that uh, that uh, police officers should not have any kind of consideration for what they do, but I think what we what we what we have failed to do is we fail to recognize how police were created as it relates to black folks. Uh, police were created in the South, at least, uh, for the purpose of uh, managing. I'm talking about the post Civil War era for managing uh, ex slaves. Uh, police worked for. Uh, in my hometown, for example, uh, I know the families uh, who could hire black folks who were in jail, police would arrest them. And I know of situations where there were certain people that needed to be arrested because they had certain skills and a certain farmer would pay their fine. Uh, this is in the 60s and 70s. We're not talking about uh, 100 years ago. And so we've got to find a way. And, and so with the police, we tend to attract police to a much, much too larger, to a larger degree than is appropriate, police who are what I call cowboys. Uh, that is, they come in to whip heads. Uh, they come in to show their, their strength and their, 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 their ability to, uh, to be in charge. Uh, I think we have to do something. I'm not sure exactly what level of uh, protection we afford them to make certain they get consideration for the for difficult task they had. I, I think one of the things we have to do is we have to figure out how to take them out of the situation where we've got mental health problems. And, uh, problems that are really none, none, not criminal in the true sense of the word, uh, uh, some addiction problems and so forth. Uh, but we must find a way to reduce their ability to get almost automatic uh, 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 immunity from certain conduct that is clearly outside of uh, what they ought to be doing as police officers. And I think that takes on, takes, uh, that means that we've got to reduce in a very large way the scope of that immunity that police officers enjoy. I do believe that, and I believe I've said that uh, to my to officers when I was a prosecutor. That I thought you you better be careful because first place you may not be able to be convicted in court, but I'm not going to prosecute your case. And uh, of course, I was uh, kind of a, a, a hot shot prosecutor because I wasn't trying to get reelected, but. Uh, we just have, our police officers have too uh, much authority and they're encouraged to be cowboys. And we've got to figure out a way to reduce that. Thank you. And Rick, do you have some, another question to ask the judges? Perhaps, you know, a last one, one that just sort of, you know, came in from the Q&A and this has to do with, uh, with mental health problems uh, and how to deal with individuals who have those issues. Uh, it says, with reduced funding and options for holding and treating people with mental health problems, what is a judge to do when jail is or seems to be often the only way to keep a person who is a repeat offender or is a danger to themselves and others? What is a judge to do? Oh, I'm going to defer. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Judge. No, I says I'm going to defer to you because you've talked about that. Y'all have done all the work in that. I think well, you have a we point. do have our law enforcement in Milwaukee County has been working with us. They're the front line. When a lot of families call, the call is not always, you know, there's someone burgling in my garage or house or, you know, no domestic violence. It really is. I want you to help me with my child or my spouse or my auntie who has a serious mental problem and need uh, some type of work now. And so if the person is flailing about and hurting or threatening a family member, they have to treat it as their jurisdiction. And so they would put people in squad cars and try and drive from place to, to and fro to find out who would take them. Uh, and if not, the last uh, cause would be to take them to jail. And so one of the projects that the uh, initiative that the council undertook was to figure out if there's something we could do. We have a number of different initiatives. I did not specifically mention the one where 
they are, the police is matched with a clinician and others. So when they respond to these calls, they can sort of triage them differently than a criminal enterprise and figure out whether or not the person has a caretaking clinic already, whether or not the family is already connected, whether they just need to get through the night. And so we have uh, the sheriff in Milwaukee County just got a, a half million dollar grant to join the team and put together a cart team. It really is therapeutic mixed with law enforcement to manage it. Because it is a mixed problem when people call. They have to go. And there may be a problem of, you know, screaming and scratching and pushing. And, and, and it's driven by the medical needs. So these initiatives don't cost money. Remember I just said our sheriff got a half million. That's just one cart team that can serve a few communities. And so Milwaukee is may have one West Dallas, some other suburbs, and now the sheriff, which covers the county. But we still can't wait on the vast number of people. We deinstitutionalized the mentally ill some time ago, and I think we're going to have to put that back on a priority burner to deal with how do we caretake our, our people who are not only substance addicted with opioids and, and other substances, but also the mentally ill. And I think that law enforcement has in Milwaukee County taken up the gauntlet uh, and became have become part of the team to try and address the issue differently than just bringing them to jail. Because remember, in jail, things can happen. Mm -hmm. They could have uh, accidents themselves, or the caretakers in the jail facility is not familiar with the treatment, or the medication provider has to figure all these things out. It would be as if you were taking your annual physical at the Milwaukee County Jail, expecting everybody to know what your background and protocol was, what kind of medications you're on, and what application you ought to get today. That's what happens to law enforcement and the jailers in a county where no one gives them the tools to help sort all of this out and figure out where is the best place for this particular system. And that's what we're trying to do. And as long as we can get the resources, it's very, very expensive. Because you need about five or different, six different players you need the therapeutic community. You need the uh, other people to back off and let you handle this outside of the traditional take them to the jail system. So you need to have some type of understanding between people who are empowered to make it go down the line as a criminal case versus flourish between five and six different entities. That's an institutional change that people are going to have to make. Judge Neal, how about yourself? Arkansas is still in the baby step range. Uh, I, I, when I was a prosecutor, I had the good fortune of having a young man, and of course he's not so young now because he's about 72, but a young man came to me in 1989 and said, listen, we need to find something better to do with these young kids who are in juvenile court all the time. And we, what we, we recognize that there are some difficulties associated with their family situations. They have less, many of the fathers are out for some reason, either uh, in the penitentiary or out otherwise. We've got to help with that. He said, I'm, I've seen the program over in Memphis where they use voluntary probation officers. He created an organization called Lee County Men of Action. I was very much a political activist. This is before I got elected judge. Very much a political activist. The, the guy who was recently elected as juvenile judge knew he got elected because I delivered a substantial number of votes for him in three other counties. Uh, so I said to him, I want, you to, I want you to bring these boys in that he's got as uh, volunteer probation officers. I want you to swear them in and give them the authority of your court so that they can work with them. If they get wrong, I want you to take the complaining against them and move them out. But I want you, as long as they're doing you some good, we moved our juvenile court. We moved our juvenile court from a from meeting in Lee County twice a week, thir Tuesdays and Thursdays, to twice a month uh, because of the work he did. Uh, what he did was he would assign one of his associates. He called himself the men, they called themselves the men of action. He signed one of his associates to each of the kids who were the worst. Uh, he took the one who probably had the reputation in the county. This is a small county, so you know everybody. The kid who was the worst in the our justice system, uh, he took him himself. And I remember one occasion that was very amusing to us. Uh, when the kids come out of the window one night about uh, 1030, he literally was standing by the window and caught him in his arms and brought the kid around to the front and knocked on his mama's door. Now, we unfortunately, we don't. We have not yet moved to the point where we believe that we ought to uh, we ought to uh, uh, put some real investment into uh, uh, responding to uh, the needs of these people who are not hardened criminals, but rather 
of substance abuse problems or mental health problems. Uh, we spend a lot of money in this state, a lot of money based on the population and the, and the budgets of the state, on prisons, and that's the first thing we take up. We take up, we take up prisons before we take up education. And if you read the papers when the legislature is about to come into session, they talk about what they've got to do for the prisons and then what they've got to do for education. But that's only because the, the uh, courts have said that they've got to meet certain requirements in education. And so we haven't got that yet. But we know that some uh, uh, some improvements can be made because we've seen the volunteers do it. Uh, it takes a real job of work to bring your people in and get involved in that sort of way, where there is no reward except to see an improved situation in your community. Unfortunately, we're we're coming to the end of our discussion. We could go on much longer because it's been very inspiring what you've shared with us. Um, I want to ask each of the just judges to take maybe two minutes to leave us with some thoughts as we leave, to inspire us, to challenge us. And Judge Ali, what I want you to do in your two minutes is read the last sentence of your book. <laughs> That's a very powerful sentence for all of us. But go ahead. Judge White, do you want to uh, conclude first? Yes. I want to thank you again, uh, Rippon and leadership and Judge Neal for uh, giving me this opportunity. It's, it's like a burst of energy in the middle of a downturn. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we're working remote on the court. We still have lots of work on the Court of Appeals. But what I would like to say to people is that uh, we, have, we have a great opportunity here. Each day we wake up and have our energy and my grandmother says, still in your right mind, you can do a lot of good things for yourself and for other people. I want you to remain hopeful. I want everybody in the audience and to spread the word that I hope that you didn't get out of our nation of uh, challenges and, and um, institutional crippling stoppages and things like that. Uh, don't let those things scare you out of believe, scare you into believing that there's no hope. There's great hope. I wake up every morning hopeful. And um, I just love the, I'll, I'll end and give Judge Neal uh, the rest of my time, but I love um, Hamilton. My husband took me to see Hamilton twice, three times. I didn't tell him I went twice on my own too. But I love the part where uh, they talk about, uh, you, got, you, you know, you gotta be in the room where it happens. So if we apply that one little line to a picnic in the backyard and you have a family, who's Arab or Indian or black or brown, and you see them sit next door and you can walk to the fence line and say, how are you doing? Uh, I hope things are well for you and your family. You can start that way. So uh, it, if you gotta be in the room, there are not many people in the room with black and brown leaders across America, despite what it must look like. Because people come to the courthouse in Milwaukee and used to say with me as the only black woman there, I, I think I know two other black women judges. I said the one before me came 20 years before and was run, uh, lost her race uh, that next spring. And so anyway, remain hopeful and work as hard as you can to protect your opportunity and your right to have a great life in this country. When judges come from all over the world and visit me, they are really jealous of our system jealous of our opportunities. So I, I always, when they come, they're just so excited. And they, I can't even, I use translators to communicate with them. And it reminds me that we forget just how fortunate we are in the midst of all this pain, remain hopeful. Thank you so much. Judge Neal, you have the final word. I, I, first, let me say that uh, uh, I think what we try to say is that it is important for all of us to try and understand the nature of the experience of the person with whom we're dealing so that we try and at least reduce any negative impact our own biases may have. John Lewis would say, and I, I kind of add to John Lewis's uh, line when he said, if you see something, do something. Well, first, make certain you see something because you need to look, that is, learn something about how other folks' experiences so that you don't presume that because you've had certain kinds of privileges, everybody else has, that is not the case. So if you see something, do something. I think he would add sometimes, and maybe plan a, and maybe plan a march. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the fight 
this struggle we have to go through can take its toll on us, particularly when we stay intense all of the time. And, and sometimes that builds into anger, builds into bitterness. Uh, we've got to get away. We can't let that happen to us. From the uh, page 337 of my book, Outspoken, uh, uh, the Ollie Neal story, uh, I, I say this, I'm not telling you that I have it all right, but I don't hate certain white folks anymore. I'm especially thinking of Leroy Webb, the white boy in Mariana who punched my brother Prentice during one of our demonstrations. At that time, I couldn't let personal revenge damage our movement, but I hated that son of a bitch and planned to get him someday. Then about 15, 20 years ago, I got to thinking, hell, Leroy was just doing what he thought he needed to do. I've forgiven people. I used to hate for me. This is a kind of a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for attending and thank you, Jan, so much for helping the judges prepare for this and helping write the book and for moderating our discussion. Thank you, Judge White. Thank you, Judge Neal. Uh, go in peace. Um, we will have a recording of this session, which we will send out to all the attendees that they can watch if they wish. Uh, the title of that book, by the way, Judge White, is My Beloved World. It's by in Justice. My <laughs> My Beloved World, paperback 2014 by Judge Sotomayor. And if you judges would send us the other readings you suggested, we will send those out with the follow-up email. So we thank you so much, and we thank everybody who's attended. Uh, Henrik, will you take a, a, a minute here to uh, uh, give us an indication of the next webinar that, that the Senate Center will be having in about two weeks? Yes. Uh... And uh, I hope, um, you know, many of you who have joined us today will join us again in the future. Uh, in fact, our next event is uh, tonight. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, have some dinner and at seven o'clock, uh, the next uh, program starts. Uh, uh, and I, meant, I, I listed the facebook.com forward slash Ripping College CPP. We're gonna live, uh, Facebook live an event, uh, the 41st uh, Assembly uh, District here in Wisconsin has a forum and city hall, and we are co-sponsoring this event with the League of Women Voters. And so uh, we hope that uh, you could uh, join us tonight for that uh, interesting and informative discussion. And then uh, the next uh, event that we are gonna have as a webinar will be on the 30th uh, of September. So um, in about two weeks, the right to vote, past, present, and future, uh, 6.30 PM, uh, also 70, five minute conversation. Uh, it's going to be to celebrate the 100th uh, anniversary of the 19th Amendment, as well as um, the founding of the League of Women Voters by Carrie Chapman, uh, a cat of Ripon, Wisconsin. So uh, we're gonna have uh, three panelists uh, real quick. Uh, Dr. Deborah Turner, national president of the League of Women Voters will join us, as well as Genevieve McBride, Professor um, Merita, Merita UW-Milwaukee, as well as Barry Burden, who is a professor at UW-Madison. Uh, so I hope uh, you can join us uh, that evening. So thanks everybody again. And uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> and, Dr. Myron's book is Just Ask, the children's version. Yes. Just Ask, that's the children's ask. version. Yeah. Thank you so much, Judge White. Thank you. Thank be you. different, be brave, be you, subtitle, right? So everybody, <laughs> with that uh, being said, uh, have a good night. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank all of you. Appreciate it. Go in peace.